Happy birthday to me. Happy birthday to see to. Happy birthday, dear see to. Happy birthday to me. Yep, that's right. Today marks the fourth year of the See Through podcast going into year five. I've grown a lot and I'm happy to be here. And uh, so I wanted to hop on and do a solo episode and kind of reconnect with everyone. It's been a while since I've done one of these and talked to everybody, you know, one-on-one, me to you. So yeah, this episode is just going to be me kind of reflecting because it's nice to do. You know, you hit a milestone, you kind of need to reflect and process, but you also need to kind of reflect and consider the future. You know, it's, it's it goes both ways, you know, so this episode is going to be talking about the past. It's also going to be talking about the future and it's just something I wanted to do to kind of commemorate doing this podcast for four years in my bedroom. First off, I want to say thank you for listening and being here. And I'm very thankful for everyone who listens to this podcast and really, truly gives a shit about it. It means the world to me that some people actually care what I have to say. And it means the world to me that some people care to listen to my interviews. So thanks for giving me the opportunity to have an audience as wonderful as you guys are, whoever you are out there listening. The first thing I want to announce is that there is going to be a slight pause in podcast episodes coming out. I head out for a vacation this week. I'm going to Portugal to celebrate my wife's sister's wedding. So my new future sister-in-law. I'm very excited about this trip and I'm really looking forward to it, but I do not have any episodes kind of back cataloged at the moment. So none will be put out for a little bit. I do have some really killer interviews lined up. So I'm excited to get those going when I get back from my trip but there's going to be a slight lag in uh, episodes. So bear with me and be patient. By the way, this does mark episode 110. So there's plenty to go back and check out unless you've listened to every episode. And if you have, I want to hear from you. I want to know who you are because I don't believe it. I don't believe that anyone has listened to every single episode, but that'd be really cool if that was the case. Speaking of the future, I've been having some really cool conversations with multiple people, multiple companies about multiple different projects that all sound really cool and fun. Some of them might not pan out. Some of them might. Either way, I'm excited that I'm in the mix and these opportunities are kind of starting to pop up and come my way. So I just want to prep you for that. I'm also going to be working on a series of mini-sodes So these will be mini podcast episodes that are 20 minutes or less. I'll explain more later. But moving on, let's speak about what's happening right now. I'm currently at 962 subscribers on YouTube. And ever since I started this podcast, I've really wanted to hit 1,000 subscribers. And I'm so close. So if you haven't yet, head over to YouTube and just click subscribe even if you just stream it, even if you're just a Spotify person, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, even if you're just a streamer, I would greatly appreciate you clicking subscribe there. It helps me out. And if you're watching on YouTube right now and you haven't subscribed, definitely hit that subscribe button. Definitely hit that like button and leave a comment. You know, all that kind of engagement helps see through grow and it's needed to be honest with you, to actually grow this podcast. And on the flip side, if you're a person who watches on YouTube, you can help me out by going to the streaming services and following me there, leaving a review, rating the podcast five stars. Um, These are all great ways to help and they're all free. And if you want to financially support the podcast, again, no pressure. This is all on a volunteer basis, but I do have merch for sale. I have a coffee mug. I have multiple different hats. I have t-shirts. I have a hoodie. I have a long sleeve tee. Um, and I'm in the process of kind of thinking about new merch to drop. But yeah, that's a great way to support the podcast financially. And last but not least, definitely make sure to follow the See Through Podcast on social media. The handle is at See Through Pod. And that goes for Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. Um, I'm also on Facebook. Basically all the spots. I'm everywhere, basically. And to make it easy for you, links to Everything I just discussed takes place in the show description. So all you got to do is click the show description 
and there will be a link to everything I'm discussing if you want to check out. Follow, subscribe, rate, whatever it is you want to do. I made it easy. There's a link right there to do it. Check it out. All right, so enough sales pitching, enough of the shameless merch plugging. Let's talk about four years of doing see-through. So the first thing I want to talk about, which may be a surprise to a lot of people listening, is I came very, very close to quitting this podcast this year. I was looking at the calendar and I was like, you know what? My four-year anniversary is coming up in May. What if I just do it to May, end at the four-year mark? That's a strong time to end on and move on to other projects. I was so close to doing that because, yeah, that's probably the question you're asking why. Um, I was feeling really burnt out with this thing. You know, I, I put a lot of time and energy into this podcast It takes away a lot of my Saturdays, like I'm recording this on a Saturday right now. It takes a lot of my Saturdays editing. It takes a lot of my free time is basically the long story short. Um, I'm always in communication, trying to book guests and in emails, you know, and I also have a full-time job, which has been very busy lately. So I haven't had as much time. So trying to balance the two has been quite difficult in both this podcast and my paid work require me to edit video. So sometimes I just feel like I just live here, literally right here at my desk. Like this is where I live. That's how it feels sometimes. Um, and I thought like maybe I maybe I needed a break. But I didn't want to though. I was very, very back and forth on deciding whether or not to keep going or not. Because one, I've already invested so much into this podcast. I forged some really cool friendships. I've learned so much information. I've become so much more at peace with living with retinitis pigmentosa through my conversations. And I know some people out there who listen have grown through this podcast as well, or at least I like to think so. But yeah, I didn't want to quit. Logically thinking though, I was like, well, if I do stop the podcast, I will have more time to do this, this, and that. And logically, four years will mark a great time to call it quits. But I had a string of interviews that went really, really well. And out of the blue, I got rejuvenated and that passion's back. And oddly enough, I started getting emails um, for collaborations. So I was like, whoa, things seem to really be picking up. Like I said, I'm so close to that thousand subscriber mark. I seem to be getting some momentum. I have some really cool ideas that I'm going to experiment with in the future moving forward that I'm excited about. I have a lot of guests in mind that I want to get on the podcast. And I finally feel like I have hosting this podcast kind of down. I know exactly the type of messaging that I want to have. I know that I know the type of people I want to interview. I know the type of people I don't want to interview. I've got my workflow down. Everything is polished and fine-tuned. And now it's just a matter of doing the work versus figuring out how to do the work. So while reaching four years is like this big monumental moment for me, I also wanted to be transparent and just be honest because that's what I preach here on this podcast and just let everyone know that I was close to quitting this podcast. And I'm not proud of that. And I'm not saying this for attention. I'm not saying it to, you know, guilt at anyone into feeling any certain type of way, but I just want to be up front with everyone, you know, that podcasting is a grind and sometimes it can weigh on you and there's certain pressures that come up with podcasting and hosting a podcast. So I thought it'd be a good idea for me to kind of go over five things that I've learned about podcasting, you know, from the last four years of doing this and kind of share with you and give you some insight into my world as a podcaster and what I've learned through doing this, because you got to think, this is episode 110. That means I've lined up 110 episodes or, and if if there's been solo episodes, I've had to plan and write those and figure out what I'm going to discuss. So that's a lot of communication involved, a lot of pre-planning involved, a lot of editing involved, a lot of caption writing, episode description writing, Um, just a lot goes into this thing on top of the branding, on top of reaching out to guests, et cetera. There's a lot, so much that goes into this thing. And a lot of it's really fun, but a lot of it's really boring and not so sexy. But that boring, unsexy stuff makes things sexy in the end. It's hard to describe. So I kind of wanted to 
share that with you. I know some of you, some of you might not be that interested into the ins and outs of podcasting, but but I know some of you might be interested in my thoughts on running this podcast and what I've kind of my viewpoint and take on things and how I operate. So I thought this episode would be a good time to do that. So yeah, so here are the five things I've learned through four years of podcasting. All right, to start this off, the first thing I'm going to talk about is you will get more yeses than you think. And you're probably like, what are you talking about? Yeses. And I'm talking about from people that you ask to come on your podcast. I know a lot of you think that like, oh, the fact that so-and-so agreed to come on my podcast must mean that I'm a big time podcaster. You know, oh, I got the two blind brothers. I had Anthony Ferraro. You know, I have these giant influencers come on. And it's not that because I'm a big time podcaster. This podcast is tiny. You know, like I said, I'm still under a thousand subscribers on YouTube, but it's because I ask, you know, and I have a polished podcast resume. You know, I present myself professionally. I wanted to bring that up because if any of you are interested in starting a creative project, if you have a professional feeling foundation, if you start with that foundation and you just simply ask in a professional manner and you use the proper channels to reach out to people, you will get more yeses than you think. Um, I've been so surprised at how many times I've emailed someone thinking I'm not going to hear back and I get an email back saying, yeah, that's great. Let's set something up. Sometimes it takes weeks and months to to find actual time to do the interview and you got to navigate different time zones in different countries even. So that can be problematic and you also have to make it work within your work schedule, their work schedule. So scheduling can be a mess sometimes, but you will be very surprised at how many times people will say yes. You will also be told no a lot as well. So I don't want to kind of trick you into thinking that everybody's going to say yes. I'm just saying you'll get more yeses than you think, but you also get a lot of no's. And by that, I mean, you will get ghosted. You will have people say yes, and then not respond to an email when it comes time to actually book the interview. Or you will get people just not responding to your messages. I count that as a no. And sometimes it's hard to even know. You're like, well, I emailed them. I sent them a direct message, but they never looked at it. Sometimes people with large follower counts or subscriber counts, they get so much of an influx of people reaching out to them that sometimes it just gets lost in the void And you kind of just have to accept that. And you kind of have to accept, like, I have no clue if that person even saw me reaching out to them. So that's something to kind of consider as well. You got to take it in stride. You know, I've had, I've had moments that really frustrated me where I sit down, I have my room clean, I have my light on, I have my mic plugged in, I have my camera set up, I have prepped for the interview, I've done research, probably spent 45 minutes to an hour doing research on the questions I want to talk about. And I, I'm sitting there waiting. It's time to do the interview. 10 minutes goes by, nothing. 15 minutes goes by, nothing. I send a text message, check in with the guests, see where they are. Nothing. And then 30 minutes goes by, hey, something came up. Can we reschedule? And guess what? As frustrated as I am, I say, sure, stuff happens, life happens. Let's reschedule. I do the same thing again. 30 minutes goes by, Hey, something came up. Can we reschedule? That's that's where I draw the line. You know, so you are going to waste a lot of time. A lot of time does get wasted sometimes on potential guests. But once you land a guest and you actually pull off a great interview, it's such a great feeling. And it, sometimes it just feels like uh, a major win sometimes when I wrap up an interview. And I'm like, hell yeah, I got that. They showed up. We did a great interview. This is going to be a killer episode. I can't wait to edit it. But yeah, the the guest kind of frustrations will happen. Um, another thing that will happen too is people will reach out to me and say, hey, I really want to be a guest. And there's been times where I've said yes, and I've interviewed people and those episodes have turned out really good. But it's because when I review their info, I think they're a good fit. I can't interview everyone, and I guess is why I'm bringing this up, because I have a lot of people who reach out to me, say, hey, I want to come on the podcast. On average, I'm doing two episodes a month. That's only 24 episodes a year. 
I have very limited time. So if I'm interviewing you, that means I'm not interviewing someone else. I'm factoring things into my guest list. Like, am I covering a variety of topics or am I just covering the same topic over and over and over again? Do I think you are a good fit for the podcast in terms of your temperament, um, your personality? Do I think my audience will actually want to listen to you? These are all things that I'm trying to factor in. And I'm also trying to get new guests on and fresh faces as well, as well as some familiar faces. There's a lot that goes in to booking guests. But yeah, I would love to interview more people. I would love to do weekly episodes. I would love to have two episodes a week if possible. But unfortunately, I have a full-time job and this is a side project. This is a passion project. At the moment, this is all I can kind of conjure up and give you. So thanks for being patient with me. But yeah, I can't interview everyone. So, and it's no offense to you. It's just, there's, I have limited resources. All right, moving on. Number two is podcasting is cheaper than you think. I know a lot of you watch podcasts or listen to podcasts and probably in your minds, imagine it to be this really expensive enterprise and parts of it are expensive and it can get very expensive. It just depends on how far you want to go with the production side of things. But podcasting cheaper than you think. Do I make profit on this podcast? No, I do not. In fact, I'm net. I'm negative. Um, I'm in the hole <laughs> from doing this podcast. This this takes money out of my bank account. Just being honest. So, is it profitable? No. But is it gonna break the bank? Also, no. It's more of a time consuming thing than it is a money consuming thing. Like for example, I break the, I'll break down the cost. I pay twenty dollars a month for my hosting service. I use Libsyn. Basically, Libsyn is where I put my MP3 files up and it puts it on Apple Podcasts. It puts it on Spotify, all the the streaming platforms. YouTube's obviously free, um, but I pay $20 for that hosting service and it keeps those episodes up on there. Um, There's even uh, Spotify for podcasters, which used to be called Anchor, and that's completely free. So that's something to consider um, as well but you don't have as quite as much control as I have over on Libsyn. Um, this microphone, I think cost me like $300 when I bought it. The camera I use is a Sony ZV-1. Um, I use it for my interviews. I also use it for my vlogs. And I think it's around $900, but you don't have to use this type of equipment. You could get a Yeti blue microphone for $100 and it's going to sound great. You could get a cheap HD webcam or just use your own webcam and do just fine. I know plenty of YouTubers who are killing it, who use very minimal, cheap equipment. You don't need big, fancy equipment to to have a successful podcast. Another service that I pay for monthly is Riverside.fm. That's $20 a month. And Riverside is where I conduct my interviews. So it's where I record my my interviews um, since I do all my interviews remotely. So that's the production side of things, the post-production side of things, like the editing portion. I'm using Adobe Premiere, which is what I use to edit my video content and my videos for my work. I'm very fast in it, so that's why I use it. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll edit my uh, video episodes on there and then I'll just export out the audio. That's the MP3 that goes on streaming. And then I'll export out the video that has that same audio. And then that's the video version. That's all done in Adobe Premiere Pro. Um, I record some audio in Adobe Audition, like I'm using that right now to do this. Um, But that's all part of Adobe Creative Cloud. That costs me $65 a month. But I don't really count that towards this podcasting cost because I have to pay that for my work anyways, because I need this software for my day job. But yeah, when you break it down, you could start a podcast with just your phone just your webcam, a cheap Yeti microphone, which is $100, um, a USB mic, and you could start a podcast. There's really not much to it. You do want to have good sound is the main thing. The main thing you want is good sound. Without good sound, no one's going to listen because you got to think podcasts are long form. Who wants to sit there and listen to hour long conversation where it sounds like it was recorded in a tin can. That's the bummer about remote interviews sometimes is that audio suffers, you know, from these remote interviews. Not all of my guests that I interview have proper microphones. So I'm dealing with bad audio sometimes, but I do my best to clean it up with editing and um, EQs and compressors. I'm kind of a nerd on that end, 
but yeah, quality does suffer sometimes, but Hey, my goal was eventually to have a studio where I do in-person interviews. And for, for now, these remote interviews is what's best for me and what I can do at the moment. And you just try to grow and grow and grow as you can. So cheers to the future. Oh, one more thing. And I almost forgot to, to wrap this, this number two up is I have a ring light. I have one ring light and I bounce it off of the wall that's in front of me. And I think that ring light was like $250. There's cheaper ones though on Amazon. I know um, you can find really affordable ring lights, but yeah, that's what I use. I have the ring light, I have my camera, I have my mic and I have my editing software and then I have my hosting services and then I have the service that I use to conduct my interviews. It sounds complex, but it's really not when you break it down. I do plan to do like an in-depth breakdown of my podcasting workflow, um, maybe even dive into how I edit these types of things, because I think some of you may find that interesting. I would love it if more people started podcasts, especially in this kind of disability blindness world, because I think more voices need to be heard and it'll take some pressure off of me. <laughs> um, if more people were podcasting about this type of thing. Yeah, that's number two. Let's move on to number three. Number three, you will feel like a business owner. That's how it feels sometimes. Um, I feel like see-through is a brand that I've created. You know, I have merch. You know, I have a flag on my wall. I have a logo. I have messaging. I have, you know, about me sections, <laughs> you know, so... It does feel like see-through has become a brand and I am the face of the brand and I have to factor in things like, again, going back to guests, does this guest fit the brand? Basically, everything comes down as it feel on brand, which sounds cringy to be honest with you, but that's just how it is. It's like, does the merch match the vibe of the podcast? Do the guests match the vibe? Do my questions, you know, what kind of questions do I want to ask and what kind of, what kind of material do I want to cover on my podcast? You know, what kind of uh, mentality do I want to promote? Like, for example, I don't want the see-through podcast to be like a place for just whining and complaining. Uh, and I, I try to avoid the victim mentality on the see-through podcast. So I try to craft questions that kind of hype people up versus are just drenched in negativity. I know some podcasts do that where it's just kind of let's just you know, sit and powwow and cry together. And sometimes that happens on here. Sometimes it gets sad and depressing on a see-through podcast. It happens, but I want it to be real and I don't want it to be forced. And I don't want to steer my conversations in that direction intentionally. And this all goes back to how do I want this podcast to feel as part of the brand? How do I want this, my logo to look? What colors am I using? Down to even what do I want my subtitles to look like? in the uh, vertical short content that I put out there. What do I want my thumbnails to look like? Those types of things. All these little decisions basically make you feel like a business owner promoting your business and everything becomes important to you. Every little detail matters in the grand scheme of things. And it's all about pre uh, presenting yourself as a professional, right? Going back to guests, you'll get yeses. If you present yourself as a professional, you have a professional brand and guests can tell that you put a lot of thought and effort into your podcast, they will say yes, because they'll assume like, okay, this person is responsible. You know, um, they'll, they'll probably click on an episode, be like, it sounds good. He's had other guests on and it just kind of grows and snowballs. Outside of branding, you'll feel like a business owner because you'll literally think about what ROI am I getting? You know, what's the return on your investment? And you'll think about it in multiple ways. You'll think about it in your actual finances. And then you'll actually think about it when it comes to your time. Like right now, I'm, I'm in the negative on money. I'm in the negative on time. So my ROI is telling me to quit the podcast. But then I, I, see the, I do see the promise of it. And I do see the value in this podcast. I personally believe in this podcast. But when you're running something like a podcast, especially like how I run see-through, you start to think about things in that way. Like what's working best? Are solo episodes working? Was that type of content material working? Was that type of content not working? What's working best? What are people craving? What are people, um, how do people feel about this? How do people feel like that? You start to evaluate your audience almost as if they're customers and you're trying to put stuff out there that you know there's a need and want for 
all while servicing the brand that you want to be. And it's a balancing act because you don't want to sell out and just put out content for the sake that, you know, people want it because you also want it to reflect you and what you what you believe in. And you'll try things and they'll fail and you'll try things and they'll succeed and you'll learn what works. You'll learn what doesn't work. And it's all part of the process of basically being a business owner, trial and error and learning from your mistakes and also learning from your wins as well. So in, in a way, that's also a part of why it feels like being a business owner, which to me is really fun. I, I'll be honest with you. Like I've never owned a business. See-through is the closest thing I've ever had to a business. And uh, I actually really enjoy kind of being a part of something like this. I enjoy having merch. I enjoy having a logo. I enjoy being a part of a community. I love engaging with people who engage with see-through. All of it's fun to me and it, it's great. And I enjoy the business side of it, to be honest with you. All right, moving on to number four. And I think this one's the most on brand for see-through, you know, speaking of branding. And number four is you will feel vulnerable. And what do I mean by that? You are going to be talking for hours on end with guests, you know, and I do solo episodes where it's just me sometimes talking for an hour. So you got to think about it. You know, this is episode 110. Let's say on average, you know, my episodes are 45 minutes. Let's see how much time that is. I'm going to calculate it right now. 45 minutes times 110. That's 4,950 minutes of content that I've put out. And if you divide that by 60, that's 82 and a half hours of content that I've put out into the world of me being a part of conversations. And why am I doing the math on this? Then my point is you are putting yourself out there. You can't talk for 82 and a half hours and not say your opinion on things that are going to be controversial. You can't talk for 82 and a half hours and not expose something about yourself that maybe you, you are hesitant hesitant to when you started the podcast, things are going to come out and it's honestly required if you want to build an audience, you know, vulnerability is required. And I, and I build this whole podcast upon transparency and being truthful. Sometimes I'll release an episode and I'll, when I click post, I'm like, we'll see how this one goes. You know, let's see if I get canceled for this one. Um, and sometimes it's kind of like a game. You kind of feel like you're playing with yourself when you put something out, you'll be like, I wonder if someone's going to comment on this. I wonder if someone's going to comment on that. And then after a while, you kind of realize like, oh, the stuff that I was worried about, no one seemed to mind. And then the stuff that I wasn't worried about, sometimes people mind and comment on. So sometimes what you're focused on isn't what other people are focused on. And sometimes people will take issue with things that you don't even think people will take issue with. And they won't find issues with things that you possibly find problematic. The main issue that I deal with, you know, in terms of being vulnerable and the main problem that I've had to overcome and always have to constantly challenge myself to overcome is imposter syndrome. Who am I to be talking and having a podcast? You know, what are my credentials? You know, I'm not like I'm not like a professional athlete who started a podcast about the sport they played, you know. I'm not a famous musician who started a podcast about what it's like to be in a band. And when it comes to the disability world, I'm not even legally blind. You know, when it comes to my retinitis pigmentosa, you know, there's plenty of people who are legally blind or fully blind or see lights and shadows that are going to have way better, you know, life experience to kind of discuss blindness and disabilities. So sometimes I deal with imposter syndrome, but I have to remind myself, I'm providing a different viewpoint as someone in that transitional process, as someone going from, you know, not legally blind, heading towards a legally blind world. I have a lot of questions. I have a lot of concerns and there's a lot more people in my boat too. And we need a voice too. And I think from my position of curiosity, I think that's fascinating. I think, I think my, it, it makes me truly curious. So therefore, when I actually talk to my guests, I'm actually interested in learning what they have to tell me because I need to know that shit for real. But yeah, I constantly have to remind myself that what I'm doing is okay. And I'm not stepping on anyone's toes by doing this podcast. I'm not saying that I'm the voice of the blind. 
I'm just one person having a podcast, but it takes some mental kind of uh, gymnastics sometimes to kind of remind yourself that, hey, you're doing a good thing. You're doing a good job. Chill. And then you also, on on top of that, you'll also get comments here and there, uh, mainly on social media about, you know, people kind of having issues with what I'm saying or promoting. Sometimes it's by design. Sometimes I want to kind of push buttons and put out content that I know is going to get some feedback on. But yeah, imposter syndrome is very real. Um, and, and there's no avoiding it. If you want to start a podcast, you're going to find yourself thinking like, should I have said that publicly? Should I have opened up like that? Should I have kept that private? You know, I did an episode where I talked about my dad and that's one episode that I go back to all the time. And I wonder if I should have done it. But that was the most transparent and honest I've ever been probably in that episode. But I, I, I think about that episode all the time. And sometimes I cringe at the fact that I put it out, to be honest with you. Um, you'll find yourself cringing sometimes at the stuff you put out. And sometimes you'll, you'll cringe at stuff that people really resonate with. And then you'll kind of be like, okay, okay, okay. It was worth it because I, I need to be vulnerable. I need to get this stuff out there. And it's, it makes it worthwhile. But you also don't want to feel like you're fishing for sympathy or views or clicks or whatever it is. So yeah, you constantly feel like what you're putting out in the world is a reflection of you because it is. It is you talking. It is your podcast. The guests that you have on are on because you picked them or you you accepted them and you let them come on. You pick the questions. You kept it in the episode through the editing process. So in the end, it is a reflection of you. So you bear the responsibility of what your podcast is. And sometimes that weight can get a little heavy and you can kind of overanalyze it and you can kind of second guess some of your decisions, but it's all part of that business owner kind of mentality of trial and error, putting stuff out there, seeing how you feel about it, growing from it, learning from it. But yeah, some days it's sometimes you'll cringe at yourself and you will feel imposter syndrome. And, uh, but at the end of the day, What's the point of having a podcast if you're not being yourself, if you're not being authentic and you're not providing thought provoking conversations? You know, for example, I always talk about bridging the gap. My main goal for see through is bridging the gap between the the non-disabled world and the disabled world, more specifically the sighted world and the blindness world. You know, there's a lot of uh, echo chambers out there. I'm probably part of that with the see through podcast. I'm part of the disability echo chamber. But I would love to expand past that and reach people who don't live with a disability or don't live with blindness. And they just want to hear some stories from the really cool guests that I have on. Um, That's what I'm trying to do with this thing. So trying to break out of the niche and break out into the mainstream. And to do that, I have to be invested. I have to be authentic. I have to be transparent. And with that, sometimes you're going to second guess yourself and you're going to cringe. You know, I think that's all I can say about that. I'll Actually, I will say one more thing. When opening up, it's hard because I open up so others can relate versus opening up so I get empathy. And there's a big difference between the two. I think a lot of people fish for empathy. I open up and I'm kind of vulnerable, intentionally vulnerable because I want others to know that they're not alone and they're not, they're not going crazy. They're not thinking these thoughts by themselves. They're not the only person thinking these thoughts or living in these scenarios. So that's why I open up and I'm vulnerable. Psychologically, as the host, you're going to feel sometimes like, does that come across as though I'm wanting sympathy? Do I come across strong? Do I come across weak? You're constantly reflecting yourself. It's actually a good thing to work through with yourself because it kind of forces you to really figure out who you are and what you want to put out in the world and how you want to present yourself and what the actual authentic version of you actually is. Podcasting really will help you do that. But yeah, you'll you'll factor in everything. And psychologically, it can be kind of taxing because you will analyze every little thing you do and say. I guess that's the main point. But that is the last thing I'll say about that. All right, moving on to number five. The algorithm will control you whether you like it or not. It's sad. It's sad. It's sad. It's sad. We hear about the algorithm you know, when it comes to social media, YouTube, you name it. But it's a game. And if you don't play the game, you will lose. I know so many people who are in this field that I'm in, 
the podcasting world, you know, the content creation world, and they have great personalities, but they don't play the game. They're not using the right hashtags. They're not titling their videos correctly. They're not making eye-catching thumbnails. They're not releasing on the same day of the week, every time they put out something, you know, there's no consistency. By no means am I saying that I, I have everything figured out. I'm just saying I have noticed this, that I have peers who don't play the game, but also make content. And, and while their small group of friends gets a kick out of it, it goes nowhere. It doesn't go into the mainstream. It doesn't reach a lot of people. And some people take pride in it. Like, oh yeah, I don't care about the algorithm. I don't care about this. Okay, well then... Don't complain when your videos don't go anywhere. Don't complain when no one listens to your podcast. You got to have a game plan. You got to have a brand. You got to have a message. You got to have a release schedule. And your videos need to be titled correctly. They need to be the proper hashtags. You need to figure out which time of day you post on every platform and what time is best for YouTube. What time is best for Instagram? What time is best for TikTok? It's a game. What type of content works? What type of content doesn't work? It's a game. It's sad sometimes because sometimes you want to just make something that you want to make. And sometimes that is the best advice, but you also got to be practical in a sense. Like, for example, like I'm skeptical that this is interesting to anyone. It's something that I personally want to do. I wanted to go over my podcasting kind of vibe and feel, but I know a lot of people out there don't care and uh, about this and probably didn't listen to this episode. But some of you do care, so I made it. So sometimes I do disregard this advice because I have an ego and I want to, uh, sometimes I just want to do things because I want to do things. And I, that, I think that's okay when you're a content creator. You can't always do that. For the most part, you have to play the game of the algorithm. It's just the way it is. You know, you got to have subtitles. Like, for example, if you don't have subtitles on your video, your video is not going to perform as well. That's just obvious. You know, there's little things like that that just add up, you know, and that you have to factor in. And you just got to make sure your shit's on lock and that you you have everything figured out. And then going back to guests and kind of going backwards a little bit, a lot of this kind of ties in together. But like, for example, picking guests, like as sad as it is, follower count matters. You know, if I'm interviewing someone who has 100,000 Instagram followers and then I, I think about the fact that, oh, if I, have, if I interview them and they collaborate with me on an Instagram reel, I'm going to get tons of eyes on that video, which therefore might put a ton of people onto my podcast and I might get some new listeners. Because again, I'm trying to grow this podcast. I want it to be as big as possible. So I need to grow. So I think about everything with a growth mindset, going back to that business mindset, going back to guests. Some of this all ties in together. You got to interview people with large followings and you got to, and you, and then you also have to make the most out of it. You have to collaborate on posts. You have to try to grow your following in different ways. You got to play the game. Um, and sometimes you won't want to. Another thing I'll say is too, you'll feel like a sellout sometimes when you're playing the game. You really will. For example, when I'm making YouTube titles, I want to use person first language. So instead of saying disabled person, I say person with a disability or people with a disability or man living with blindness versus blind man, you know, those types of things. But when you think about it in terms of a, a title for a video, you want it to be as short and concise as possible. So therefore blind man versus man living with blindness, blind man wins. And then your, your, your titles kind of make you feel like a sellout just because you're trying to make them short and concise. And it's all about the YouTube algorithm and it's all about growing and grow. So sometimes you do sell out in those types of ways and stuff like that happens. Stuff like that comes up. Little things like that you start to realize. And that's an obstacle, especially with this kind of niche subject matter that I cover with disabilities and blindness, because there's a lot of sensitivities in this world. You have to understand the disability community as a whole, the blindness community, what's off the table, what's on the table, um, how to title things, everything. Everything adds up. And then you have to skew it towards your brand and you have to make it work for you. But yeah, you got to play the game and the algorithm drives that. The algorithm will tell you what's working and what's not working. 
And, uh, and if the algorithm doesn't tell you what's working and not working, your audience will as well. All right, so that wraps up the five things. I could probably go on and on and on and on and on about podcasting. I, I love talking about the art form of podcasting, not to sound pretentious, but that's five little things about it. Um, again, I do want to dive deeper into this. I do want to explore my workflow. I would love to teach more people how to podcast. I would love to get more people in the disability community, blindness community, podcasting. I would love that. So if you're interested in learning more, hit me up about that. I can I can steer you in the right direction. And if you have any questions for me, email me at the see through podcast at gmail.com um, or just leave a comment if you're watching on YouTube. I'll get back to you there. If you, if you message me, I will get back to you. Um, if you leave a comment, I will respond to your comments. Yeah, don't be shy. You know, that way I can confirm that I'm not just talking to the void. Sometimes I think that. Sometimes I get worried that I'm just talking to no one and it's just I'm in outer space and I'm just talking into the void. So I would love to hear from some real people out there uh, so I can feel a little bit less crazy. And again, just a reminder, there is going to be a pause in episode releases, but don't fret. I have some really killer interviews lined up. I'm also going to be releasing some mini episodes like I talked about that will be 20 minutes or less. And they'll let me cover topics that I don't really get to cover during my interviews. You know, they'll be more specific. It'll be kind of like reaction type of thing. So I might be reacting to news articles about potential cures. I might be reacting to some pop culture moments that are involving like people being ableist, little things like that. I think you'll get to hear more from me and it will give me another outlet to get more content to you and to keep you guys more involved in, into the world of see-through. And again, I'm really trying to grow this thing. So I have to play the game like I discussed. So I'm playing the game of content and I want to get as much free content to you guys out there as possible. And on that note, do keep in mind that I do do all of this for free. I do have merch for sale if you want to help me out that way. But again, I'm running a business in which I don't charge anyone anything. So keep in mind, I'm doing a lot of this out of just the sheer passion for it and the learning aspect of it. Because over these four years, I've really felt like I've grown a lot as a person um, and as a business person in a weird way, as weird as that sounds. And last but most importantly, I just want to thank everyone again for sticking around for four years. That's unreal. Without you, this podcast is nothing. Thank you so much. I appreciate every single one of you, every single guest I've had on, every single person who's listened to one episode or two episodes, all the episodes. I'm thankful for anyone who takes time out of their busy day to spend time with me on this podcast. It means the world to me. And I'm happy that I can report that I'm rejuvenated and I'm excited for the future. And I hope you stick around and watch this thing grow the way I want it to grow. And uh, you know the drill. Stay transparent, everyone.